Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Welcome to this encore segment of St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. And before we talk about the Mississippi River, I want to remind you about our St. Louis on the Air Facebook group. In addition to listening to St. Louis on the Air on the radio or through our podcast, you can also connect with our production team on Facebook. Search for St. Louis on the Air there and request to join our Facebook group. We love to hear from listeners and we draw on your ideas for the show, both in real time and leading up to and after our segments. So please join us on Facebook. And now to our conversation. St. Louis owes a lot to the Mississippi River. The mighty 2,320-mile waterway is why the city is here, why the city flourished. And when railroads displaced riverboats and new industries replaced old ones, why the city declined. So how has being on the banks of this mighty river shaped this city? An exhibit on display at the Missouri History Museum through June of 2021 examines that question in all of its facets. And it's accompanied by a book that brings additional context. That book is called Great River City, How the Mississippi Shaped St. Louis. Last December, I spoke with Andrew Wanko. He's the author of Great River City and also a public historian for the Missouri Historical Society. I also talked with David Lobig. He's a curator of environmental life at the Missouri Historical Society, and he is the content lead for the Mighty Mississippi exhibit that's at the Missouri History Museum. I started by noting that Andrew Wanko argues that St. Louis doesn't always think about the river, but we should. I asked him how essential it's been to our existence. Essential is an understatement. Literally, there would be no St. Louis without the Mississippi River. But I think the thing that fascinates me, you know, I'm I'm probably like most St. Louisans when I think back about my personal memories of the river, and I don't really have that many. You know, I have, we went down for the fireworks for the VP Fair. We went to, uh, I have vague memories of the floating McDonald's that used to be on the riverfront. A pivotal but, memory. Uh, yeah, and it's in the book, don't worry. Uh, but, you know, that's really about it. We really don't pay a lot of attention as average St. Louisans. You know, we fly across the Poplar Street Bridge, 30 seconds we're past this river. We don't think about what this this incredible piece of, of geography used to be. And why do you think that is? Um, I think uh, some of the things you mentioned in the intro that um, the river certainly has, our relationship has changed incredibly to the Mississippi River from what it was back in the 1800s. Um, unbelievable night and day difference. But we as St. Louisans, it's it's about time we re-examine the river because everything we know about the city we inhabit owes it owes itself to the Mississippi. So um, that's what the book tries to do. We, we take a look at snapshots from across the river's history at times when it, um, when it affected St. Louis in different ways. And David, you're principally responsible for this exhibit that's now up at the Missouri History Museum. Tell us how the questions you're examining there intersect with what Andrew's doing here in the book. Sure. Well, we try to take uh, a long view on the history and and realize that people have been here for thousands of years, but a thousand years ago, a really important civilization began here, the Mississippian period culture that's represented in Cahokia, but also on the side of the river all throughout the watershed. Uh, reaching thousands of miles on the river and its tributaries. So uh, we're looking at that, but also looking at contemporary issues and and concerns for, say, the last 50 years or so when we're looking at water quality concerns, biodiversity, floodplains and their management and commerce and transportation. And, of course, that fur trade that, that brought St. Louis into being in the, in the 1760s and, and the steamboat era, which really made St. Louis grow into a, 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 a mighty industrial city. Now, in terms of these environmental issues that you mentioned, I thought one of the most fascinating through lines in Andrew's book is just how filthy St. Louis was (laughs) for so long and how that ended up contaminating the river. You even title one chapter Waves of Garbage. (laughs) Um, Tell us, tell our listeners a bit, what was happening here in the 1910s that you're exploring in this book? Oh, uh, it's unbelievable when you, you know, when I get a drink out of the, out of the faucet today, I, I never, you look at that crystal clear water in your hand, you never think to yourself, this is the Mississippi River I'm holding. But a hundred years ago, St. Louisans undeniably would have seen the Mississippi River in that glass. 
they would have been holding an opaque brown, unfiltered, gritty glass of Mississippi River water. And they were then drinking this. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, you know, for a city this close to the river, you figured we would have figured out how to get water effectively to its citizens pretty quickly. But it was actually for the first hundred years of St. Louis's existence, they did not have reliable running water. And so they certainly didn't have reliable filtered water for much longer after that. Um, you look at newspaper advertisements from the late 1800s and this shock advertising was all the rage back then even too. You have these advertisements for water filters and they show a uh, glass of water under a microscope and there's all these bugs and worms and things. They, they were playing into St. Louisans fears of what they were drinking and you know every, every sip must have felt like a life gamble to know that you were drinking this water that all of these industrial sites were dumping their waste into. All of the city's human waste and animal waste was going right into that river and they were pulling it right back out and people were drinking it. And when you say that they were putting their life in their hands, um, as the book makes clear, they really were. Um, you talk about cholera. This killed a whole bunch of St. Louisans. Um, David, talk to me about the environmental. Um, wh where was this cholera coming from? Well, uh, contamination of the groundwater is really the, the, the basic problem during the, the 1800s. But people were all over the world were being hit by this cholera, epi cholera epidemic. And it was brought here uh, by all this immigration. There were thousands, hundreds of thousands of people coming through St. Louis, some of them staying and bringing disease like cholera to our community and uh, requiring uh, some of the steamboats to have to stop at Quarantine Island and people to, to be kept there uh, for a period of time. But cholera really hit us the hardest in the 1830s and 40s and continued into the 50s. And 19, 1849 is, is when we had this gigantic epidemic, the same year, this huge fire that was also brought by steamboats. So Tough year. <laughs> yeah, tough year. So in the exhibit, you can see uh, things like the first uh, microscope for the, the chemist of the city of St. Louis. So the city of St. Louis decided, hey, we need to have a, somebody looking at the water quality and, and examining it. Imagine that. that. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, and thinking about it and making sure that it's clean. So, you know, our water treatment systems are hugely important today. And, and, and there's, there's, there's still something that, you know, or, uh, we, we lead in many ways. We have a great tasting water now. St. Louis has been very claimed. proud of yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so this is the, our resource. You know, this is something that people maybe don't realize that where this water is coming from. Andrew, in the book, I found it very interesting that even though people were dying of cholera, they really didn't understand that this was tied to this. Tell us about some of these theories they had of, of what they thought was killing them. Yeah, that's right. And so in 1849, again, um, as much as 10% of the city of St. Louis was killed by cholera across just a few short months. We don't really know uh, because so many of these people were immigrants living in very poor conditions and their deaths went undocumented. Uh, but nobody knew what caused cholera at the time. At the time, they thought it was uh, something called miasma theory. They thought it was these flo floating poisonous fogs that came off of dead animals and off of waste that was in the streets. So they were looking to the air. They thought they were breathing in bad air, and that's what was causing cholera. So St. Louisans in the 1840s were actually burning uh, tar out in the middle, bonfires that they would dump tar on top of to produce this smoke to hopefully get the miasma away. As we know now, miasma isn't a real thing. Uh, really, they should have been looking under their feet at the, the water that was coming from the ground because it was contaminated. St. Louis had no sewer system in 1849, so people were throwing their waste out into the streets, and that's exactly where they were getting their water from as well. So the fecal material was making its way into the water supply. Vicious cycle. More, more cholera produces more Infected water produces more cholera. So speaking of fecal material, I want to talk about Chicago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was fascinated by the sidebar focusing on the water wars between yeah. St. Louis and Chicago and what Chicago did to us in 1900. <laughs> this seemed, I previously had not been angry at Chicago. I'm now angry at Chicago. Yeah. Uh, tell our <laughs> listeners why they should share this this ire. Yeah, if you if you want a reason uh, beyond the Cubs uh, to, to be mad at Chicago. So in, in 1900, um, Chicago built the Sanitary and Ship Canal which actually reversed the flow of the Chicago River. That city's waste had been dumped into Lake Michigan, which was very bad for that city because it wasn't going anywhere. So they actually reversed the flow of the Chicago River, which sent all of Chicago's waste eventually to the Mississippi by way of the Illinois River. St. Louis had a fit. Uh, of course, these newspaper articles, waves of, of cholera and typhoid coming down river from Chicago. Uh, so they actually filed, the state of Missouri on behalf of St. Louis filed a injunction with the 
the Supreme Court that Chicago was sickening St. Louis. After six years, turns out they couldn't produce any actual legitimate evidence that this was true, and the Supreme Court threw it out with a very stern warning that St. Louis should watch what it's saying because, need we remind you, Memphis and New Orleans are downriver from you, so you might not want to chase this too far. <laughs> That's interesting, the legal yeah. um, subtext on this. I mean, St. Louis yeah. actually had a point, yeah. <laughs> but it sounds like other cities could have made that same point It, about it was us. a nationwide issue. For the first time, cities were linked in these new ways by waste. You know, this was an issue that everyone was having to solve, that Kansas City's waste was ending up in St. Louis, and St. Louis was ending up in Memphis. It was a real issue that, you know, up until the 1960s with the with the Clean Water Act and some of those, some of the environmental measures, it remained an issue, uh, how to get rid of waste in the United States. And it, and it remains that today. There are uh, approximately 50 cities that take their, their water from the Mississippi River, and uh, you know, that's something like um, 30 million people are uh, as estimated. So there so are a lot, there's a lot of sharing of this water. they're taking their water from the Mississippi, but mm-hmm. today mm-hmm. Um, this water is not the big cup of mud. I mean, today we can point to this with some pride? Well, through our water clarification and sanitation systems. Mm-hmm. So, so like the St. Louis City Water Division and Missouri American Water, Illinois American Water, they, they treat and process that water. Uh, there's still plenty of sediment, in, and especially south of the Missouri River. So Sure. So yeah. one wouldn't want to take a, a glass of, of water and <laughs> Right out of the <laughs> river and, drink, and drink it? Probably not, no. <laughs> um, now, you dug up a wonderful quote from a St. Louis botanist named George Engelman. He mm. was writing after a devastating fire in 1849 that had destroyed the riverfront. Less than a decade later, he found that the city had bounced back. He wrote, St. Louis is the center of North America, if not the world and of civilization. We burn one-third of our steamboats— destroy one-tenth of the wealth of our citizens in one night, kill one-tenth by cholera, all only to show how much we can stand without succumbing. Yeah. What do you think gave early St. Louis its resilience? <laughs> the St. Louisans certainly do love to talk about their city, don't they? Yeah. Um, it, it really was, as David had mentioned, immigrants were coming by the thousands across the 1840s and 50s. Um, Irish and German immigrants, uh, both in the 1840s, were escaping problems in their homeland. In Ireland, it was potato famine. In Germany, it was these political upheavals that caused thousands of immigrants to leave. So by over the course of the 1840s, St. Louis grows from a city of more like a town of 15,000 to a city of nearly 100,000 in just 10 short years. The population goes six or seven times over. Um, An incredible amount of industry and all these steamboats that are arriving on the levee. So what he's actually referencing there, the same year as St. Saint, as Saint Louis suffered the cholera epidemic, that summer, there was a huge fire on the riverfront that burned 15 blocks of the St. Louis riverfront. 23 steamboats went up in flames, an incredible disaster. And he was looking out across the riverfront as if nothing had ever happened. It was amazing how quickly the city had rebuilt. And it gives you a sense of just how the Mississippi was America's highway. You know, this was the place where all of these goods were coming down and coming through St. Louis. So over the course of 10 years, the city had completely rebuilt its riverfront and he was just amazed at what he was seeing. We're talking to Andrew Wanko. He's the author of a new book, Great River City. And the book is a companion to an exhibit now open at the Missouri History Museum. Our other guest is David Lobeg, and he's the content lead for that exhibition, which is called Mighty Mississippi. Now, something that I learned about um, that I was very surprised by is how we owe our continued existence here on the banks of the Mississippi River to Robert E. Lee, of all people. Um, What was this engineering problem that he was called to fix? Well, he was... uh a member of the Army Corps of Engineers. He was a young lieutenant in the 1830s, and he is, his first real job was to uh, come out here to the West. He's from Virginia, and uh, see if he could uh, apply his skills to engineering the river to free up our harbor, which had been silting in. So the Mississippi is naturally a river, as many large rivers are, that changes its banks, changes, changes its channel uh, with the seasons, with the years, and uh, it was making its way to the east uh, and and into what we know of as East St. Louis. And that was a much uh, clearer channel for steamboats. Our harbor was hard to access. They mm-hmm. needed to get the silt out of that harbor. So so Lee's job was to engineer some structures in the, in the river itself to uh, cause the river to channel, uh, scour out its own channel closer to the Missouri shore, closer to St. Louis. And so this fix that he put in, um, is that still something that um, continues to be in effect today? So the Army Corps of Engineers continues this since 1837 to uh, channelize the river. 
and now makes it uh, possible for uh, barges and boats with a draw of eight feet in depth to easily navigate. So they have a number of much more permanent structures in the river, both concrete and, and, and stone, that, that keep the river sort of trained, is the, is the vernacular, trained into place. And it can no longer access its uh, floodplain as well through, through levying on the, on the banks and hardening of the banks. So, so it's much, much more um, evolved today. Lee really started this in the 1830s. Uh, that was, a, as we said, the beginning of his career. It went on, of course, to lead the Confederacy in the, in the Civil War, which we're not maybe so enamored with. But, um, but this was a major change for the Mississippi River. The, the United States didn't see its river as something that um, uh, needed that kind of attention. Uh, mm -hmm. Congress was really slow to appropriate funds. In fact, it was underfunded throughout most of his time here, all of his time here. And uh, the success of Lee didn't happen until af long after he was gone. Our city engineer continued that work. But... Um, so that was that was uh, the beginning, and that was because of steamboats. Steamboats were here by the hundreds, and they were they were needing to get access to these big ports like St. Louis. And these steamboats um, are such a big part of what was happening here. I mean, it, it's fascinating it, the way you describe it. It sounds like they were just a nonstop stream of them making their way down this river. Yeah, actually, I mean, it, there there are reports that there could be steamboats lined up for almost four miles of the St. Louis riverfront. So far beyond what we would consider the riverfront today, stretching all the way up in North St. Louis and all the way down south, almost to where like Anheuser-Busch is today, just rows of steamboats on end. And these things, you know, they were, I think there were 5,000 or so steamboats on the, the Mississippi and Ohio River system by the 1850s. And of course, every one of them was stopping at St. Louis. So you can just imagine not only how busy this levee is, but also how dirty this city, again, getting back to how like each one of these steamboats is burning through incredible amounts of wood wood, all these people carting goods back and forth. St. Louis was this bustling, active place, and it's it's hard for me to imagine truly what that must have looked like. And these steamboats um, sound wildly dangerous. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. We like to think of steamboats today. You know, when you see one on the river, it's timeless and graceful. Actually, a lot of them suffered pretty young and violent ends. Uh, you know, there were f these frail wooden boats, and you've seen the Mississippi River. You can't see anything, even a foot under the water. So if there's a downed tree in the river, there's a big sandbar. These boats would regularly hit these things and go down. It was very common for steamboat accidents to occur. Uh, some of our some of our most famous St. Louisans were involved in their own steamboat accidents. When James Eads was moving here in 1833, the steamboat he was moving on caught fire and sank, and he was you know he was lucky to make it out alive. Uh, John Darby, who was one of the mayors of St. Louis, um, he he came across on a ferry boat that took forever, and it was the same, he he talks about how difficult it was to get across the river and how dangerous it felt and people were jabbing poles into the river bottom so again we we fly across the poplar street bridge across the stand uh, bridge it, it's amazing to think it used to take people two or three days some of them didn't make it here at all how dangerous it used to be crossing the mississippi and going up and down the river there were lots of steamboat explosions too that was another major way in which they met their demise and it was really unusual for all these thousands of steamboats that we're talking about these little wooden these wooden boats they were blowing up and and hitting snags and sinking in the water at such a rate that they they were uh, it was unusual for them to to survive more than five years. So wow. so they would be be rebuilt or new ones replace them all the time. And and we we're talking about them lining up on the on the on the shore. They're actually cheek to gel. They're not end to end. So they are side by side, diagonally parked along the river with their noses kind of upstream mm. along the Mississippi River uh, um, at, at St. Louis for one, two, up to four miles at times. Yeah. yeah. So. And when did that begin to change with the steamboats um, just no longer being such a, a going concern on the river? They really started declining and uh, because of rail uh, traffic. So after the Civil War and after the construction of the Eads Bridge, which uh, was completed in 1874, there was more and more rail traffic making its way uh, easily across the Mississippi River. Previously, that rail traffic had to disembark and go across the river on a ferry, which is kind of bizarre, I think. You have to unload yeah. all these these trains and then reload them again on the, on the opposite bank, which is, is crazy and a lot of work. So uh, because of the rail traffic, by the 1890s, they were still quite popular, but they had a lot of competition. And in the 20th century, they were gone as, as packet boats, that is, conveying cargo. 
by the uh, by the 19 teens and 1920s. So they really became excursion boats at that time. They became a nostalgic connection to the river, and people would could go on them for to enjoy the old, good old days. Yeah. It's interesting, you talk about how difficult it used to be to cross the river. And I'm thinking about how our Illinois suburbs are so close to the city of St. Louis. For those of us who live pretty close to the river, you know, you can get there in two minutes. And yet so many people on the Missouri side so seldom cross it. Do you think the river mm. presents a psychological barrier to us, even though now the situation has changed so much? It's It certainly does. And um, when you look at partic- the histories of particular communities on the east side, you can really see that. I mean, honestly, the, the story of East St. Louis, um, its its full arc is because of the Mississippi River. When East St. Louis had started as a small settlement called Illinois Town, and in 1861, they renamed it East St. Louis because it kept growing and getting bigger. And it became this sort of conveniently distant place for factories to open up. It wouldn't bother anybody of note over here in St. Louis because it was on that side of the river. Um, So some of the issues like the 1917 East St. Louis uh, race riot that occurred, one of the most tragic moments in St. Louis history, the, the factors that led up to that point, this sort of rampant industry and this, um, you know, a lot of government corruption that that led up to this point where you had these these tensions brewing over, that can all point back to the river, this idea that it was over there, so it was out of the way and, and wasn't really worth uh, paying attention to. So it, it really is, when you, you can look at some of the complexities of our region through the lens of the Mississippi River very easily. Mm-hmm. I think that, that also because uh, of how we built our environment, we our built environment, our communities with concrete and steel, we've kind of turned away from the river because we can manage our lives better when we're not being flooded all the time, right? So St. Louis is built on a, on a series of bluffs, about three bluffs high, um, off the river, so it doesn't tend to get flooded as much as the east side. The east side's a floodplain. It's called the American Bottom. And the river really wants to and really kind of needs to meander back and forth over the course of many years, over hundreds of years. And building in that floodplain is not a very successful idea. So uh, the way in which we re- relate to the river it should probably be readdressed and thought of more considerately about uh, where we do that and how we do that. It's a mighty river. It's a mighty Mississippi, and it tends to flood and be very violent at times. There are also many people that make their lives on it, that, that go there for recreation. It's a beautiful, wonderful river to get out on and in. I've done it myself and highly encourage other people to. And Andrew, do you think with the arch renovations that you cover sort of at the very end of the book, that we're in this new era where we can maybe begin to appreciate this river that we've turned our back to for so long? I, I hope so. And that, honestly, it was a surprise for me when I started this project. I didn't know how little I knew about the Mississippi River. It really is something that, again, it's this incredible um, piece of geography in our region. It's unlike any other. You look back through history and you see how how incredible people thought it was. I think we are overlooking what we have here. Um, you know, St. Louis doesn't have mountains, it doesn't have beaches, but we have an, a river unlike any other, uh, socially, culturally, geographically, historically. It has all of these stories tied to it, and it's so important to our region's sense of identity. And I think people should be more proud. You know, it, it, it's a it's a gritty, uh, ugly, some people might call it thing, but I think people should be very proud of the river and should uh, turn their focus to it more. That's Andrew Wanko, author of Great River City, How the Mississippi Shaped St. Louis. He's also a public historian for the Missouri Historical Society. I was also joined by David Lobig. He's the content lead for the Mighty Mississippi exhibit at the Missouri History Museum. I spoke with them last December, shortly after the opening of the exhibit, and it's on display through June of next year. Tomorrow on St. Louis on the Air, we'll listen back to my conversation about the St. Louis Art Museum's Millet and Modern Art from Van Gogh to Dali. That exhibit's stay has been extended through September 7th due to the coronavirus pandemic. And we'll also hear tomorrow from educator Jane Elliott. In 1968, Jane Elliott was a teacher in a small, all-white Iowa town. On the day after the assassination of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., she conducted an exercise that changed her third-grade students forever. The now-famous Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes exercise showed Elliott's students how irrational prejudice was. And back to thinking about the Mississippi River, we go out of today's show with the St. Louis band, The Bottle Rockets. Live in a river town It's pretty little It's high on the sides And it sinks in the middle If it rains too much The river comes down Fills up the low spots All over town Get down the river A river get down Won't you get down the river A river get down Once again you have this old town, so get down, river, get down. 
Podcast episodes of St. Louis on the Air are available at stlpublicradio.org. Or you can subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, the Google Podcast app, or wherever you get your podcasts. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening. I'm Sarah Fenske. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.